it's absolutely amazing to be back in Cape Town. I was here with my wife this time last year, and uh, Cape Town was still kind of coming out of the drought, and it's just amazing to see Cape Town lush, the dams full. It's an amazing thing not to have to shower in a bucket. Uh, it's an amazing thing not to have to let it mellow if it's yellow. <laughs> Cape Townians know that. Every time I went to preach in, in Cape Town, uh, I'd ask for a, a bottle of water, and they'd say, no, no, no water, but he has a coffee. And uh, I mean, Cape Town has some of the best coffee anywhere in the world. But by the end of two weeks of preaching, I was just like, can I get a water? Uh, your coffee's fantastic. I love coffee. But I mean, I joke, but there was a real, real shortage. And it's just so amazing to be back in Cape Town and see the Lord pouring out his rain on this beautiful city. Thank you, Cape Town, for your incredible, beautiful hospitality. You are amazing. Let's give it up for them. All the churches here. Uh, Water is life, isn't it? Water is life. Druvors is amazing. But if you're thirsty, it's just like whatever, you know? Coffee is remarkable. If you're thirsty, water is life. Water is liver. Amanzi ayapila. Agua sevida in Spanish. Water is life. Bani hijivinhe. Is that right, Ramon? He jiven here. Got it right. <laughs> Swahili. Maji ni maisha. That right? Come on. Thai. Nam ben chivit. Water is life. Is that right? No. <laughs> I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop right now. I want to talk to you about a daughter who asked her father for water. A daughter who asked her father for water. It's an obscure little text in Joshua, and it's uh, a woman called Aksa. And she asks her father, Caleb, for water. And I'm going to read the three verses, then give a context, and then give an application. Joshua 15, 16 to 19, and Caleb said, whoever strikes Kiriath Sefer and captures it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, as wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she got off her donkey, and Caleb said to her, what do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing. Since you've given me the land of the Negeb, give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper and lower springs. Water is life. As I say, I've never ever heard a message on this. And this is a parable of prayer. I want to talk to you about asking like Axa. Uh, we've lived in America for 11 years. I've kept my South African accent, I think. Uh, I'd love to speak American right now because then it could kind of rhyme axing, asking like AXA. Uh, but every time I speak American, my wife just says, stop it, that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> asking like AXA, what, what does it mean to ask like AXA? This is a parable of prayer. And, and Spurgeon is the only commentator that I've heard commentate on this verse, the good old Spurge, and uh, so here's what he said. This brief account of a family appears twice in the Bible. Hey, just go back to that, that picture quick. <laughs> go back to the Spurge picture quick, won't you? Uh, Kevin, stand up. Kevin's one of our pastors <laughs> standing with us. This is Kevin. Don't you think he looks a little bit like Spurge? Anyway. Uh, Kevin, just a, just a dear, dear friend, and uh, you, know, you know, you go through airport security where, where it takes a photo of your face and tries to match it to the photo on your passport. So, so Kev's traveling and he goes through security, but he's wearing, because he's a big Spurgeon fan, he's wearing a, 
a photo of Spurgeon with, with a boombox and it says the Spurge. So he puts his passport in and it takes a photo and then the camera goes up and down to make, match the photo to your face and it goes like this, it goes Whoa, like this, takes a photo of the Spurge, matches it to his passport, <laughs> prints it out, the guy says go for it, you know. <laughs> but this is what Spurgeon says. This brief account of a family appears twice in the Bible and I believe that it is for good reason. So it appears in both Joshua and Judges. Uh, It gives us a potent insight into the dynamics of prayer. Here is a picture of an earthly father called Caleb who gives a good gift to his children as they ask. God invites us to investigate the nature of their asking and the nature of his giving to give us a glimpse into the dynamics of prayer. So we know that in the families of the Bible, we get a glimpse into what it is to be in the family of God. Uh, That the gospel of adoption gives us a father, gives us a family, gives us brothers and sisters. And Jesus actually asks us to look at the families in the Bible and even look at our own families. Remember Luke 11 where Jesus says, you, if you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? In other words, he's asking, he's giving us permission to look at the families in the Bible, our own families, and say, this is just a little glimpse of what it is to be in the family of God. And I want to charge you humbly but boldly from this passage to ask the Father for his spirit. I want to charge you. A brief context, Caleb Most of us know Caleb and Joshua were one of the 12 spies that Moses sent into Canaan, spy out the land, and there they saw giant grapes and giants. I mean, the grapes were so giant that two spies had to carry a whole cluster on a big pole between them. It was a very very fruitful land, a land full of milk and honey. But it was a, a land full of giants. And 10 of the 12 spies came back with a bad report, their hearts melting with fear. Only Joshua and Caleb gave a good report, saying, Yes, they're giants, but the Lord helping us will take us in. Moses said they had a different spirit. From that time on, the 10 spies are never mentioned again. But Joshua and Caleb lead the charge the next 45 years into Canaan. Joshua 15, this context, picks up where they've just taken conquest after conquest after conquest as a people. They've inherited the land by the power of God. And now Caleb comes to his brother Joshua, his leader, and says, I am still as strong now at 85 as I was when I was 45. Give me my hill country. And Joshua, just being an open-handed, generous, gracious leader, says, thanks, Caleb. You've been absolutely amazing. Take Hebron. And Joshua 15 is this this context of this 85-year-old giant slayer. I mean, surely his muscles, his bones, his mind must have started to get tired, but there was a virility of spirit in this man. And he's just slaying giants, taking cities, taking the hill country. And then he gets to this one city, Kiriath Sepher. And for some reason, it's too much for him. The giant is too big for him, perhaps. And he says, I I need a younger man. I need a younger man. And this man, Othniel, puts up his hand. And Othniel happens to be Caleb's brother's son. He's a nephew. It's all in the family. He says, I will, I will. And And he slays the giant. He takes the city. And Caleb offers his daughter's hand in marriage to whoever will take the city. And so Othniel slays the giant, takes the city, and gets the girl. In our generation to generation theme, I I love this passage because it's, it's a glimpse of what it is to be a generational family on mission. I think very often we see this Uh, a kind of generation to generation in a very linear way. Okay, we've fought our battles now, pass on to the next generation and they will fight. This Caleb was still fighting at 85 for heaven's sake. And there is a call to, to Caleb's, I would say anyone over 50, and I'm almost there. So don't slow down. Caleb's men and women, we need you. We need you to keep fighting. Yeah, there's a biological life stage reality, but God offers a Caleb spirit, this virility of spirit, to continue taking the hill country. 
And then he says, look, I'm fighting. I'm not slowing down, but actually I need help. And Othniel stands up. It's not just passing the baton of faith down. There's this multi-generational amplification of faith together where you can slay some giants, you can slay some giants. We need each other together, amen? And so what does this teach us, though, about asking? How do we ask like Axel? Because Othniel seems like the hero here. But I want to submit to you that Axa is the true heroine. Axa, in fact, is a type of Christ. And she teaches us, this is a parable that gives us a glimpse into the dynamics of prayer, the dynamics of asking. And the first dynamic is this, that the basis of asking is the Father's goodness, not ours. The basis of asking is the Father's goodness, not ours. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. So Othniel may have been this brave and noble warrior, but he was a reluctant asker. Why? Why? I mean, he just won a wife for his valor. And now his wife, I mean, the, the scene is they got married. They probably come back from the honeymoon. You know, that honeymoon is amazing, but you know that feeling on the last day of honeymoon where you go like, we're going to open up all our wedding presents. And they're probably sitting at home opening up their wedding presents. And she asks Othniel, go and ask my father for a land. Go and ask him for the farm. Go and ask him for a dowry. And he's just reluctant. He, he doesn't want to. Why? Because he's asking, on what basis should I ask him? The last thing I got, you, beautiful Axa, I got it. I earned it. It was my valor. Now what do I have to offer him? And I don't blame him because Caleb was iconic in Israel. He was like this grumpy giant slayer, scary dude, scary father-in-law. And I don't blame him, but Axa had a vision of Caleb, certainly a giant slayer, but not grumpy at all. No, ask my father. He's just given you me, but actually there's more where that came from. Our reluctance to ask our father is because we have not understood the gospel of adoption. We often, even ministry leaders here, we, we tend to relate to the Father on the basis of our valor, of our performance. So if we've had a good week, and the giving is up, and the preaching was great, and the numbers are up, we come in confidence to God in prayer. And if all the metrics were down, we just like, ah. Or if we've sinned, if we've lost our cool. Actually, the basis of asking is adoption. She is saying, he's not your father-in-law. He's your father. Ask my father. Ask my father. He is a giant slayer, but he's not grumpy. He's gracious, and he is generous. He is generous. Remember when Jesus, on the cross, well, before the cross, he, he's praying, Luke 11, and uh, he just has this incredible fatherly, father-son relationship with God. And the disciples are just saying, Te teach us to pray. We do, we're tired of looking in at your prayer life. Te teach us to pray. And he begins, when you pray, say, our Father. I tell you what, we so easily skim over those words. Those words are cataclysmic. Our Father. He's saying, ask my Father. He's your Father. My Father is your Father. My Father hears you like he hears me. And Jesus said, my Father always hears me. We know that on the cross when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the only moment in the gospel that Jesus was recorded as not calling God Father. He called him a more formal word, Elohim, my God. Why? Because in that moment, the sin, the brokenness, the shame of us all was placed upon him. The father turned his face from his son. The son was bastardized that we might be adopted. On the cross, Jesus was opening up the family circle. My father is your father. I'm willing for a moment to be forsaken that you might be adopted. 
And that is reaffirmed in the resurrection where Mary, the friend of Jesus, comes and clings to the resurrected Christ. He says, Mary, don't cling to me. I'm going to my father and your father. Doesn't that change the way we pray the Lord's Prayer? Our father, the same father of Jesus. I'm Jesus' younger brother, younger sister. Oh, he, he, I'm not praying in my name. I'm, I'm praying in, in his name. I'm not praying in the goodness of my name goodness of his name what have we done or not done that we think causes God to do close his ears to our prayers what have we done or not done and you go oh, Alan you're talking to pastors and leaders we understand the grace of God we understand the gospel of, of adoption we don't all we need to be reminded. Remember John Stott says, justification is marvelous. It's marvelous that God the judge pardons us. It's even more magnificent that God the Father adopts us. Adoption is the crown jewel of the gospel. I love justification. Thank the Lord for justification. But, but, but let's move on from there. Thank you for that. To the gospel of adoption, our Father. Some of us need to allow Jesus to say, you're praying in my name, not your name. I confess I'm a Seinfeld fan. And I didn't discover Seinfeld in America. I, I discovered it here. How many of you know Seinfeld? He's a comedian that just happens to kind of be all over the world. And I'm hesitant to kind of import American stuff. But when we got to America in 2007, we had no credit and we couldn't get a TV license, and so we were like, well, what will make us feel at home? Seinfeld. So we went and got, out, got, got a whole like, DVD packages of uh, Seinfeld, and uh, it was fantastic. So there's, there's Seinfeld. Um, that's not Terran Williams on the, on the right. Um, <laughs> I think Terran Williams is a cooler Kramer. So that's, that's uh, Seinfeld and Kramer, and uh, sorry, Terran, buddy, you're much cooler than Kramer. But... Anyway, Seinfeld has brought out this, this new series called Comedians in Cars Drinking Coffee. And have you seen it? It's on Netflix. It's fantastic. And he just goes around in different cars and picks up his friends. And over coffee, he interviews them. So one of my favorite is Seinfeld and Kramer. And so they're in Malibu. He picks them up in an old rusted VW bug. And they're just reminiscing about the good old days. And then Kramer starts to unpackage his soul. And he starts to talk about a time seven years ago where he lost it on stage. And he got heckled in the audience and he started to insult and just fly off the handle at the, at the audience. Racist slurs, anti-Semitic slurs. It's, it's on YouTube, don't go and watch it. <laughs> and Seinfeld, who is Jewish, starts to minister to his friend. And he says, Kramer, you're carrying a bag. It's time to put the bag down. Put the bag down. God's given you a gift. Put the bag down. <laughs> and I feel like God wants to say to many of you, put the bag down. Jesus is the true and better Seinfeld. <laughs> put the bag down. Put the bag down. What is it that you've said or done that you just go, causes the Father to block his ears to my prayer? You're not praying in your name. You're praying in Jesus' name. Thank the Lord that the basis of our asking is God's goodness, not ours. Secondly, the dynamics of asking, the posture of asking is grateful insistence. The posture of asking is grateful insistence. So she got off her donkey and Caleb said to her, what do you want? She said to him, give me a blessing. Since you've given me the land of the Negeb, give me also the springs of living water. Those of us who have children, there is nothing like it when a human calls you mom or when a human calls you dad, right? There's nothing like it being called that. It's amazing. But all of us know our kids have a kind of a posture or a tone of voice when they want something. Dad, you just know, before they asked it, Dad, before she had said anything, Caleb knew she was coming to ask him. And something in her posture caused him to say, what, what, what do you want, my daughter? 
Now, what's fascinating about this is that the narrative kind of rushes forward. There's this mysterious missing piece in the narrative because we left asking, well, did they ask for land or not? Othniel certainly seemed reluctant. We don't know if Aksa actually asked. All we know is that Caleb gave, since you've given me land. And so we have to assume that the Bible wants us to look at Caleb, this giant slayer, as very, very generous. We don't even know if they've asked. And, and part of the beauty of prayer is that the Father knows what we need before we've asked. And if Caleb was grumpy, he would have said, what are you coming to me again for? I've just given you a husband. I've just given you land. Now what? He just says, what do you want? I love her posture because her posture is humble. She gets off her donkey. You know, prayer is getting off our high horse. It's saying, Lord, you've, you've given me some great things. I've got this husband, I've got this wife, I've got this land. But actually, it's, thank you, it's, it's, it's not enough. I'm, I'm going low. Prayer is not ordering the Father. He is not our cosmic genie in a bottle. He's the Father. Our Father who art in heaven. We must remember that it's not an ATM machine who art in heaven. She comes low, but she comes with grateful insistence. Since you've given me the land of the Negev, give me also springs of living water. What was the land of the Negev? It was essentially the Negev Desert. We've recently been in Dubai. It's very close to Dubai. And the Negev literally means this, the rolling hills of the parched land. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but some of those wedding gifts that you get, you ever got a wedding gift that you go, we're gonna re-gift this thing? The one time Ronelle and I, early days, we don't do this anymore, we re-gifted by mistake to the person that gifted it to us, you know, it was just like terrible. But, <laughs> so bad, it was none of you, none of you. But sometimes we like that with what God gives us. You, you've given me the rolling hills of the parched land, can I re-gift this? Since you've given me the Negeb, can you give me something else? What is your Negeb? What is your rolling hills of the parched land? Is it your city? Is it your team of leaders? Is it your gifting? Is it your intellect? For some of you, it might even be your family or, or, or your marriage. And I don't want to be glib with this. Some of you are in, in incredibly parched lands whether it's economically or politically or socially or religiously. Many of us have these moments where we're just like, Lord, you've given me the rolling hills of the parched land. Since you've given me this, can you just give me somewhere else? Something else? Or can I go somewhere else? You ever feel that? One of my, my favorite writers, John Steinbeck, talks about this incurable virus of restlessness. Don't you sometimes feel like you have an incurable virus of restlessness where you just, you wanna be like tumbleweed, just roll me on to some more fertile land, please God. And what I want us to see is that though AXA has a humble posture, she is insistent and is actually not discontentment, it's gratitude. She says, since you've given me the rolling hills of the parched land, give me also springs of living water. She's not re-gifting. She, she's saying, thanks for the farm, Dad. Thanks for the farm. I'm gonna need some resources to thrive here. If I gave Dan a car, and he said, Al, thanks for the car. Since you give me the car, can you give me the keys? I wouldn't say, you ungrateful, discontented, so-and-so. I'd say, no, no, actually, that's good stewardship. Giving him the car, maybe it's not the car of his dreams, but give me the keys. If you dropped your phone, iPhone 10 maybe, and I was like, I've got, I've got a seven. 
here we go. And you came, he's like, since you give me the seven, I mean, I don't even know if there's a store that has a seven charger, but can you give me also the charger? I wouldn't say, you're so discontented, ungrateful. Actually, the, the since give me also is, is a statement of contentment and stewardship. And my friends, this is a wonderful way to pray. Since give me also. Lord, since I find myself in this city, in this church, with this leadership team, with this gift package, with this intellect, with, with this family, since you've given me, thank you, Lord, give me also. Because if you realize that, that, that God is kind and gracious, he doesn't want to kill you in the land he's given you. He doesn't. We sing, oh, you're a good, good father, never let me down. But, but sometimes, honestly, we get to a place where you go, do you want to kill me here? Remember Luke 11, after Jesus teaches his disciples the Lord's prayer and then he gives also a parable of prayer and he gives the parable of this neighbor who has surprising guests coming from out of town and she's got no bread. So she goes and knocks on her neighbor's door. Knock, 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 seek, 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 ask, ask, ask. And the neighbor in the middle of the night just says, don't bother me. She just carries on, give me bread, give me bread. I've got some, since I've got these neighbors, give me bread. And then Jesus says, and that neighbor will open up and give bread because of her shameless audacity. Don't you love that? Shameless audacity. In other words, Jesus is inviting us, giving us permission to bother God. Humbly, humbly, See, one of the ways that we do it with humility is we do not demand a change of our circumstances. Very often we get tired in prayer because we're demanding a change of circumstances. And that's not humble. Humility is saying, you're a good father. You do not tempt me. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Yes, there might be sin involved in the mix and the demonic involved in the mix, but you're a sovereign father. I believe you've planted me here for the display of your splendor, for my good and your glory, even though it feels like the rolling hills of the parched land. And Lord, I insist humbly and gratefully that you give me springs of living water to thrive to farm this land, to be fruitful. Grateful insistence. Why ask? Because she's been given land rights and she's asking for water rights. This is not rocket science, it's pretty simple, but I just wanna hammer home this point. Why ask for water rights if you've got the land rights? The clever people say, one of two theories. One is that there may have been a parcel of land just outside the boundary that had a well in it. And so she was asking just for another sliver of land with the well, or otherwise, that the land actually had a couple of wells. But what often happened in Scripture was that there was quarreling around wells. Genesis 26, Isaac, there was quarreling around his father's well. So it was actually asking for Caleb's provision and protection to bring peace to that well so that they could access the well that was rightfully theirs. Friends, God could have you in a land that seems almost un almost impossible to cultivate. Where there's a well, there is a way. Where there is a well, there is a way. My son says that's a dad joke. Final point. God loves to resource us wherever he calls us, but he waits for us to ask. So Caleb gave her the upper and the lower springs. Isn't this beautiful? She asks for one spring and she gets two. Remember Jesus talking about his father? He gives the spirit without measure. Now to him who's able to give exceedingly abundantly above what we can think or ask or imagine, he gives the spirit without measure. Yeah, I have two. Yeah, I have two. What is your land of the Negeb? 
Can you see it as a gift from the Father? Can you persist in asking him for resources to thrive, to be not just for your own survival, but for the thriving of all the people there? My concern about my generation, I'm a Gen Xer, is that we tended to stay away from parched lands. We had a lot of good drinking parties in the sense of, well, both. <laughs> but you know, my generation grew up with loving being filled with the presence of God, the power of God, but we tended to resist going to hard places and difficult places. The next generation, I see them running to hard places. It's a wonderful thing. But I wonder if they know how to ask for spring, springs of living water. Friends, I love the fact that this is a church planning movement that also has such a strong mercy and justice arm. We're running to the rolling hills of the parched land. We will die without springs of living water. Whenever scripture talks about springs of living water, it talks about the presence and power of God accessed through the person of the Holy Spirit. And we know that as a movement, we, we absolutely are convinced that the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture. Spirit of God does His best work through Scripture. The Spirit of God flies behind the preaching of the gospel. Didn't you love Steve just laying down the, the breadth and depth and richness of the gospel? But we are called to be a gospel-centered, Spirit-empowered people on mission. And let's never allow ourselves to fall into this tyranny of reaction. 10 years ago, I discovered the gospel again. I felt like I was born again, again. Beautiful. And we used to, 10 years ago, have many prayer lines to be filled with the Spirit. And I just got such a holy dis dissatisfaction. I wanted to be, see lines lining up to be baptized in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I love the fact that over the last 10 years, we've seen more people come to faith. It's been wonderful. We've learned how to preach the gospel better, to live it out better. But oh, in the last five years, I was just like, Lord, I still feel like I'm dying without springs of living water. I don't want to lose this biblical heritage of being a spirit-saturated, spirit-desperate, spirit-dependent people. Yeah. best preaching in the world without the power of the Spirit will bring judgment and condemnation. Jesus stood up in John 7 and said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink and rivers of living water will spring up to eternal life. And then John gave a beautiful little commentary afterwards. He said, verse 38, he was talking about the Holy Spirit whom they would receive once he was glorified. When we are asking for springs of living water, when we are asking Jesus for springs of living water, talking about the Holy Spirit, friends, we are not talking about the Holy Spirit who's out there trying to get him to come and live inside us. We have to be wise here. There is a difference between the indwelling of the Spirit and the infilling of the Spirit. And we believe that every single believer who looks to Jesus is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You don't have to have a special ceremony to try and get the Holy Spirit in you. You could not have believed and repented unless the Holy Spirit regenerated you. He was at work. You, we are born again by the Spirit. We're not separating the work of salvation, the work of regeneration, the work of election from the work of empowering, but it's a vital part. And Martin Lloyd-Jones talking to people that just believe, well, you know, I've got the Holy Spirit because I'm saved. He said, you got it all? You got it all? Well, then why do your lives look like they look? Why don't they look like the book of Acts if you just got it all? We do have the whole Holy Spirit, but to be filled with the Spirit, to, to have this, as Jesus described, rivers of living water will well up into your, from your inner being to eternal life, actually says, maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't have all of us. They're parts of our life that's like the rolling hills of the Negev. They're parched. 
lands in us. Can I give you a secret? I ask for the Holy Spirit to fill me every day. That's not a boast. That's a declaration of dependence. I think God's given me some gifting and some experience and incredible wife and amazing church. It's just not enough. I love getting off my high horse and coming low to the Father and say, you've given me so much, but actually I'll die here without springs of living water. And some of us need power to be able to respond, to go to parched lands. Remember Jesus to his disciples? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, but wait, wait, wait. I've given you land rights, but wait until you get water rights. Wait until you receive power from on high and then go. Land rights, water rights. So some of us need, need to wait and, and ask for, for water rights to be able to go. But honestly, my sense is for many of us, we don't need going power, we need staying power. We have been sent and we have been planted and perhaps there's an incurable virus of restlessness. They're just saying, oh, maybe there's a better, less parched land that you can send me to. And the Lord wants to plant you freshly and water you for the display of his splendor. Oaks of righteousness. Felt that so strongly for the couple going to Turkey. God's given them power to go, but actually they need power to stay. Because many of us have these wide open doors of ministry and many adversaries. Friends, I think that's normal life. Paul says, I'm going to stay in Ephesus. Until Pentecost. I love that, Pentecost. Because a wide open door of ministry has opened to me and there are many adversaries. Most of us would say, that's reason to go. <laughs> Paul says, no, no, that's reason to stay. Good. Reason to stay. So Lord, we thank you that we ask on the basis of your goodness and not ours. We come to you, your beloved sons and daughters. We thank you that our lives are hidden with Christ, our older brother, and that you hear us because you hear him. And so we want to put the bag down. We want to come to you assuming the best of you, Father, that you give the Spirit without measure. And Jesus, we thank you that you spoke to your disciples and you commanded them to ask for the Holy Spirit. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? And Holy Spirit, we, we know we're not trying to twist your arm to come and live inside us. We thank you that you regenerated us. You empowered us to repent and believe. We were born again of you. But now we ask, Spirit of God, that you would come and open up and unblock springs of living water, springs of joy, springs of power, springs of healing, springs of boldness, Come like you promised. Come as you please. We thank you. We thank you.